Our speaker today is Rashmi Vinayak. Rashmi is visiting us from CMU, where she's a professor of computer science in the uh, computer science department. Um, Rashmi's done a lot of interesting work at the intersection of you know, network systems and coding theory. Um, I find a lot of her ideas to be super creative and uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you read that work or hear about it, uh, at least for me, it puts a smile on my face. So, uh, Rashmi, we're super excited to have you here. She's not a stranger to MSR. Uh, as a student at Berkeley, you know, she, she also interned here. Twice. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. She was a recipient of the PhD fellowship. Um, um, she'll be talking to us about sort of some work that is uh, not just related to storage systems, but also sort of uh, inference workloads. Um, and this is work, I guess, done with two of my other favorite you know, <laughs> collaborators, Jack, who's here this summer, who's a Rashmi student, and Shivram, who used to be with us, uh, with us here uh, last year. So welcome, Rashmi. Thanks for the kind introduction, Amar. Uh, hi, everyone. It's always good to be back here at MSR. Uh, before going into the talk, I'll just quickly give you all a flavor of the kind of research that my group at CMU does. So I called my group as thesis, standing for theory and systems, because we do research both in theory and in systems, with a tight synergistic loop between the two. So we formulate theoretical problems based on real-world system challenges and take the insights from the theoretically optimal solutions that we arrive at and take it back into the systems world to build real-world systems that significantly advance the state of the art. So on the, on the theory side, we mainly work on problems in information and coding theory, specifically on what are called erasure codes, or also known as error-correcting codes. We also use tools from probability and statistics. On the system side, uh, our group is mainly interested in reliability and predictable performance in large-scale systems. We are looking at various kinds of systems and applications, including storage systems, machine learning systems, content distribution networks, and live streaming. Today's talk is about redundancy in large-scale systems. Large-scale systems are often prone to non-ideal operating conditions, such as failures, stragglers, load imbalance, and so on. And redundancy is a common approach to impart resilience against such situations in large-scale systems. So for example, in a data processing system, it could be duplicating queries, or in a storage system, it is duplicating data. While redundancy helps in imparting resilience, it comes with a cost, right? So redundancy would often require additional hardware resources, which requires increased cost in buying those equipment, increased power to operate them, increased cooling, and more operations, and overall significantly additional cost for the system. So it's important to introduce this redundancy in a resource efficient manner. So the, in this talk, I'll have two parts. In the, first, uh, in the first part, I'll talk about resource efficient redundancy in data processing systems, specifically in prediction serving systems, basically systems that take already trained machine learning models and serve inference for queries. And in the second part, I'll talk about resource efficient redundancy in distributed storage systems, specifically large scale cluster storage systems. In both of these parts, I'll draw tools from coding theory, machine learning, or data analysis, and also blend them with system insights. OK, so let's get into the first part of the talk on resource efficient redundancy for prediction serving systems. So this is hot off the press. We are currently working on the camera ready version for uh, this year SOSP. So this is a joint work with uh, my PhD student Jack, who is right here, and uh, Shivram, who is at uh, Wisconsin Madison. Jack is really the main workhorse behind this work. So when machine learning is used in production systems, there are two phases, right? So there is training and there is inference. So during training, one does iterative optimization over the data and arrives at a model, 
right? And then during inference, this already learned model is used to serve inference on queries. So for example, a query could be an image of a dog and the model is, for example, could be an image classifier and the prediction would be the class of that image. So platforms that deploy such learned models and serve queries, serve inference on these queries are called prediction serving systems. And now given the rise in the use of machine learning in various applications, there are several prediction serving systems both in the open source world as well as which are offered as cloud services, including at Microsoft. So at a high level, the architecture of prediction serving systems includes several servers running these already trained models. They are called model instances. And typically, a particular model is run on different, model, on different servers in order to serve high query throughput. And then often there is a front end which takes in the queries from the clients, sends them to these model instances, and once the inference is ready, it is collected and given back to the clients. Right. So these prediction serving systems often fall into the critical path between the applications and the end users. And hence, it is important to meet service level latency agreements and also operate with really low predictable latency. And like any other service, they face slowdowns and failures that are common in a cloud operation or a cluster operation due to various reasons, right? And hence, these can result in inflated tail latencies, and there is interest in minimizing the tail latency in such systems. So there are various solutions to minimizing tail latency in such systems, and they can be broadly classified into two categories. So one of them is what I'll call reactive, that is in which we can send a query to a server and wait for us some time and then retry if we don't get back the response in time. So we could send query to server one and if it is slow or maybe failed, then retry it on another server after waiting for a certain time. So the main problem with these kind of solutions is that we have to wait. So they are reactive. So you wait for a certain time before issuing the second request. So there is a delay in the mitigation for this increased latency. So the other class of solutions is what I'll call replicative, which is more proactive. That is issuing requests proactively to multiple servers. So we could, in the same scenario, we could send the query simultaneously to multiple servers and then take the response from the one which comes first. So if one of the servers is slow, we can take back the prediction that comes from the other server. So the problem with this class of solutions is that they require more resources. So in this example, you need at least 2x more resources. Right? So if we look at this cartoon plot where I have recovery delay on the y-axis and resource overhead on the x-axis, so lower is better on the y-axis and left or lower value is better on the x-axis. So the reactive approaches are low on resource overhead because you issue a redundant query only when needed, but the recovery delay is higher, right? And for replicative solutions, resource overhead is higher because they are proactive, but the recovery delay is small. So in this part of the talk, uh, I'm interested in seeing how we can enable in between points. And we are going to do this via a tool called erasure coded computation. So I'll now next quickly give a primer on what erasure coding is and what erasure coded computation is, and then see how to use it in prediction serving systems and what are the challenges and what are our solutions to address them. So a very quick primer on erasure coding. So you might have already heard about this and know about this. This will, in, in that case, it will help in you know, setting the terminology and we come onto the same page. So it's a resource efficient way of adding redundancy. And I'll use storage as an example to illustrate this concept. 
So let's say we have two disks, disk 1 and disk 2, storing D1 and D2. And let's say our goal is to add resilience against a single disk failure. So a simple approach for doing this is replication. That is, you have two copies of this data. So if one of the disk fails, there is another copy. So we are all good, right? However, here, 50% of the total resources are being consumed for redundancy. Now, the same goal can be achieved using erasure coding in the following manner. So instead of having four disks in total, now we'll have only three disks. So we have data D1 and D2, and we create what is called a parity, which is just an XOR of D1 and D2. Right? And these are stored in these three disks. So now, if a single disk fails, that data can be recovered by just subtracting, or if it's an XOR, just XORing the parity and the other data that is there. So we've achieved the same fault tolerance, the single disk fault tolerance, with only 33% of the total resources being used for redundancy. Right? So in general, it is well known that erasure codes achieve desired level of re resilience with much lower resource overhead. So in general, you can have k data units, and that is encoded to create our parity units, right? In the example we had, we had two data units and one parity. So here, in general, you can have k and r. And when decoding, you can take any k out of the k plus r units, and then you can decode to get back the original k data units. And also, I'd like to note one general characteristics of most of the codes employed in practice is are what are called linear codes. Specifically, what it means is that the parity units that are formed are linear combinations or linear functions of the data units. And this will come up later in the talk. OK, so this was about erasure coding. Now, what is erasure coded computation? So now consider this scenario where we have multiple copies of a function f that are being computed on different nodes. And now let x1 and x2 be the inputs, and f of x1 and f of x2 are the corresponding function outputs. Now suppose we want to add resilience now against slow or failed servers, not the disks in, like in the previous example, but now the servers being slow. And now we want to add resilience to get back the function outputs and not the data. OK, so in, how can we do this using tools from erasure coding? So in this scenario, what one would do is you create encoding of the queries, the inputs x1 and x2, and create a parity input, p. And there is a redundant computation unit which operates on this parity. And if one of the original function units are unavailable, you could decode the output of that function by using the output of the available ones and the redundant computation. So let me just contrast between storage and this to highlight the differences. So in, in storage, we wanted to add resilience against disk failures, and we want to recover the data, right? Whereas in when using erasure coding for computation, we want to add resilience against the failure of servers, and we want to recover the function outputs, not the original data. Right? And in order to add resilience when we want to recover the data, as you recall, we encoded the data and stored the parity. And then if one of the disks is unavailable or failed, we recover it by doing uh, this decoding or reconstruction on the data itself. Now, when using erasure coding for computation, on the other hand, we are encoding the inputs and processing it through a redundant computation unit. And when the output, one of the outputs is unavailable, the decoding is performed on the function outputs, not on the original data. Encoding is done on the data, but decoding is done on the function outputs uh, in contrast to in data storage. Yeah. So is, is it the same F or is it different? Okay. That's a very good question. So it, 
So I'll talk about different approaches. It could be same or it could be different. Uh, I think it will become cl more clear as but we go down. I was just yeah. looking at the figure and the F there. The, the, is not this is, it's, yeah, it's a very good point. So it's not necessarily F. It, it could be different. I think I forgot to change this F after changing it. Yeah. Um, it seems like you would know to, to calculate the severity, you would want to enumerate the inputs you could have and try to match that with the motivation mm -hmm. you gave of like a dog example. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems hard in that setting to, to be able to enumerate your, your possible inputs. Very good question. Um, so this is where this, some of the challenges that I'll talk about when using this specifically in the domain of you know prediction serving systems will come. Yeah. So there are in some cases where you don't have to enumerate which is where it's easier and when in which case it's you know like it will work with existing codes and in, in other scenarios as you mentioned where this enumeration would not be it, it's not apparent yeah so there are some kind of structures where enumeration is not needed that's where the linearity will come in so I'll go into that yeah okay so now a very good question so I think leading to that so question is when will such a reconstruction work, right? So we are encoding the queries and but decoding on the output of the functions. So linear functions commute with linear code. So recall that in a linear code, the parities are linear combinations of the data units. So if you have a linear function f, then the encoding and the decoding will commute with the linear operations. So let's just take a quick example. So let's say f of x is 2x, which is a linear function, and we want to operate uh, this f on different servers. Let's say x1 and x2 are the two inputs, and we create a parity, which is just sum of x1 and x2. So now we send it through these servers, and let's say one of them is slow. So now we can recover f of x2 by just subtracting the function outputs on the parity input and f of x1. So this all works out and we get back the right output. This is because f of x is linear and our encoding is also linear, right? So this actually is a scenario where you don't have to enumerate the inputs because of the linearity, okay? Okay, however, the key challenge is actually in handling nonlinear functions. So, and let's see why it doesn't work out, right? So let's take a simple example where f of x is e to the x. And let's take the same scenario as earlier. We have three copies of e to the x on different servers and x1 and x2 are the inputs. And we create the same parity x1 plus x2. And now when we send them through these functions and let's say again the second server is slow. Now if we try to do the same decoding f of, f of p minus f of x1 we don't get back the correct output. Okay, so, so this was about erasure coded computation and an inherent challenge in handling nonlinearity. Okay. So there have been a lot of related work in the domain of coded computation. In fact, coded computation for tolerating hardware fault uh, failures has been looked at a few decades ago. And it was only recently that Lee et al. introduced coded computation in the distributed computation context and specifically for distributed matrix vector multiplication problem. And since then, there has been a large body of work on coded computation. And this is a uh, burgoing and a very exciting field in the domain of coded computation or in the, in the domain of coded coding theory right now. However, uh, oh, so before going into that, so let me just put this in context. So let's see when we are using coded computation in prediction serving systems, what does it mean, right? So now in a prediction serving system, the function f is going to be a machine learning model and many of the state of the art machine learning models are now neural networks, right? So we are going to have, let's say, a neural network as a function. And now inputs are going to be queries. So you would be encoding queries and performing a redundant computation, which would be another model. And then if one of them is unavailable, 
you would decode the outputs from the original model and what comes along the redundant path. And the goal would be to reconstruct what is unavailable. Okay. So however, the key challenge here is that many of the state-of-the-art machine learning models are neural networks and neural networks are highly nonlinear. Right? So within neural networks, between the layers, the matrix vector multiplication that happens is linear, but end to end it is nonlinear because of the nonlinear activation functions, right? And as we saw, it's challenging to handle general nonlinear functions in this coded computation framework. In fact, existing coded computation schemes are applicable only for a limited class of functions, and specifically linear and polynomial functions. And more importantly, efficient schemes are known only for linear functions. For example, in the case of polynomials, even a degree two polynomial requires overhead more than full replication. So our solution to tackle this problem is to use machine learning along with coding. So basically, we propose using a learning-based approach in designing the coded computation framework. So basically, learn various components of the coded computation framework. For example, we have this encoder, decoder, and the redundant computation unit, right? So there are two approaches towards this. And one of the natural approaches is to keep this redundant computation unit, same as the original function, and this actually conforms to the traditional coded computation frameworks, and learn only the encoder and decoder. So this is basically le like learning a code. You learn the encoder and the decoder, and that's what we called it, like learning a code. So a little bit of details on this. So basically now, the encoder and the decoder are learned using a neural network. And the encoder takes k queries as inputs. In this example, k is 2. And it outputs r parity queries. And in this example, r is 1. And similarly, decoder would take k inputs, which are predictions from these models, right? So in, in this context. And the output would be r unavailable predictions. So how do we train these neural networks, which are encoders and the decoders? So the training data set used are same as the original model training data. And we mimic stragglers or failures by artificially erasing the outputs from these functions when training. And we backpropagate through the original model. So I'll take a concrete example to go through this. So let's take f as an image classifier neural network. And let's choose k equal to 2 and r equal to 1. That is, we are encoding two queries and creating single parity query. So these two are the original models. And let's say this is the redundant model. So recall that in this approach, the redundant model is same as the original model. So this is the blue neural network. And we have the encoder and the decoder. These are the new neural networks that need to be trained. So let's take x1 and x2. These are the two training images just picked at random from the training data set. And we pass it through the original models first. And it is also sent through the encoder because the encoder acts on these queries. right? And the output of the encoder is passed through this redundant model. And during training, we will erase one of the outputs of the two original models. And the decoder acts on the remaining two. And it outputs a vector which represents the final layer vector. So if in this example, this, if this is an image classification model, right? so the this vector will have values such that you know, the maximum value corresponds to the predicted class of the image. Just a clarification. Yeah. So when the encoder is taking two inputs, yeah. 
is it some function of x1 and x2 that gets fed in as one input to the encoder, or it's actually taking two inputs? It, it is taking two inputs so it's a batch in this case. Or yeah, so, so since k is two, mm -hmm. so the encoder takes two images as input. And so, for example, right? So, the so pixel values of those would be basically right, <coughs> right. Right. So, right. So, for example, if it was a pre-designed code, like let's say handcrafted code, for example, let's say just single parity x1 plus x2, mm -hmm. then it would be taking x1 and x2 as input. So it's the same way. Yeah. Okay. So this is the forward pass, right? And now, since this is training, we know what f of x2 should have been, right? So we can take some loss function, whatever is appropriate take the delta function and propagate it back through the original model. But the original model is not modified because that's the same as the, you know, whatever model is deployed. Only the encoder and the decoder weights are updated during this back propagation class. Yeah. So the, the output of the redundant model is like gibberish too, like without decoding, right? Yes. So uh, is that also included in the, the Fs? Uh, so what do you mean by included for, in there? For example, f of ah ah. So ah, okay, I see. So you you you, you diff only the output on the monkey image. Yes, output. So output after decoding, right? Okay. okay. So so after decoding in this scenario, when the output of the second yes. model is unavailable, you expect f of x two. Yes. Yeah. So each of the models on the left are spitting out classes, and the one on the right is spitting out, spitting out, I guess, some class as well because it's of the same type. Right. Um, yeah. So it, so all of them are giving f of the. So we are taking the final right. layer. The type of the output is still class. Each of those is outputting a class. Yeah. So 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 think of it as as a vector. Mm -hmm. When you do an arg max on this, so the arg max output will be a class. Oh, I see. You're doing the feature vector there. Yes. Exactly. So. Okay. It's, yeah. Any. I mean, any reason why you're doing that as opposed to just a class prediction? I mean. Right. So, so in traditionally, the output of each of the models is just yeah, true. So we are not taking just the class output because that loses a lot of information. Okay. So we're taking the vector, the last layer yeah, vector, as the input. Yeah. Back through that. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So basically, using the same training data set as the original model, and mimicking stragglers or failures by artificially erasing the outputs from the models and back propagating through the original model. So this training method is applicable for any numerically differentiable function f. So, and this is a broad class of functions because all the machine learning models, for example, that are trained on the like, platforms are numerically differentiable. Right? So this learning a code approach is really the first coded computation approach that enabled doing coded computation on this broad class of nonlinear functions. And it was also the first work that proposed and enabled use of coded computation for prediction serving systems. So previously, the works on coded computation that looked at machine learning, the focus was more on training. However, it has its downsides when we look at it from a systems perspective. So in order to understand the downsides, let's go back to this architecture of prediction serving systems and see how it how it would be incorporated into this model uh, and then we can see the downsides very clearly so so recall that in a prediction serving system typically you have a front end and you have model instances being run on different servers so a natural place where the encoder and the decoder of this coded computation approach would fit in is at the front end where as the queries come in, they are dispatched to the model instances, and they are also sent to the encoder, and the encoder output is dispatched to another model instance. And as the predictions arrive, they are sent back to the clients, and if any one of them are, is slow or unavailable, then you could use the output from the parity query, and then decode, and then send it back, right? So the main, the, yeah. There's a constraint on how fast the decoder has to be, right? It has to be much faster than yeah. the regular model. Yes, yeah, so that's, yeah, I'll come to that. So that, absolutely, yeah. So so one of the downsides here is is that 
you know, we need a bulkier front end because now the neural network encoding and decoding has to happen at the front end. Right? And also, as you just mentioned, this has reduced opportunity for improving tail latency because the redundant path, that is, which goes through the encoder, the original model, and the decoder, now takes a lot more time because you're doing neural network encoding and neural network decoding, which takes a lot of time. So, and these, these downsides pushed us to explore further on this learning-based coded computation. And we arrived at another approach, which we call learning parity models, which is basically, so we keep the encoder and the decoder very simple. So it could be, for example, a generic encoder and a decoder, such as just doing subtraction, addition or subtraction, or a task-specific but still simple encoder and decoder. For example, for an image classification, it could be just downsizing and concatenation. I'll go into details of this later. But keeping the encoder and the decoder very simple, so very low time, right? Uh, but learning a new model for the redundant computation. So not keeping the redundant computation same as the original model. So, and this new model is what we call as a parity model. So let's see now how the training of a parity model would, would look like. And this is very similar to what I described earlier in learning a code. So we use again the same training data set as the original model and minimix stragglers and failures by you know, just deleting the function outputs when we are training. Let's again take a very concrete example as seen earlier image classifier function and k equal to two r equal to one, that is encoding two queries, creating a single parity query. And for this example, I'll assume a generic encoder and decoder, that is just addition as an encoder and subtraction as the decoder. Okay, so now, yeah. So is the input to the encoder the original images or some feature map? The oh, it, it's the same, it's like the original images. Original. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it will so be very pixel clear. values. Yes, so it, it will be clear. Yeah, so so these are the two original neural networks, image classifiers, and I have two because k equal to two. Right? And now this is the parity model. So now recall now that unlike the original, the, the first approach, now this is a new neural network that needs to be trained. So this is the red neural network now. Yeah. Of that. Is the structure of that model the same as model? Uh, or do you have to learn, is it an architecture search in that space? Very good question. Uh, the It could be different, but in this example I'm using the same and in the evaluation that I'm going to show, we use the same so same the architecture and we are just learning the weights. But you know, there's nothing preventing in the framework to use a different model and in, in fact it could be useful and it can help in improving the accuracy. So the strange thing about using a completely different model is that then you have to somehow tell it the cost for this model also ought to be is it exactly yes. You know, it needs right. to be bounded by the cost, yes. you know, yeah. like the, the inference cost of that. Yes. Should be like an upper bound right. or right. You know, maybe slightly lower because you have additions in Right. right, absolutely, yeah. So basically, you would want to choose a network which has a similar time, right, you know, latency as the original model, yes. But I guess that can be encoded in the sort of search space. Yeah, uh, right. As you're searching through that, you just search for appropriate models. Right, right. Okay, cool. So just as a quick recap, we have k equal to 2, r equal to 1, two original networks and one parity model that needs to be trained. And as I mentioned, in this example, I'll assume the uh, generic simple ad addition encoder and a subtraction decoder. As before, we pick two images from the data set at random and send it through the original models, for uh, which are the blue neural networks, and also send it through this addition encoder. And now the output of the simple encoder is sent as an input to the parity model. And during training, you we erase one of the outputs, and the remaining that are existing outputs from these models are sent to the decoder, which is just a subtraction decoder. And we again have this f hat of x2, and this is the forward pass. And since we, since this is training, we know f of x2, and we can take a loss function on this and propagate 
the loss back and in the, this time we are changing the weights of this parity model which is what we are learning right yeah this is very interesting it's like blowing my mind <laughs> so this is what I meant by putting a smile on you <laughs> yeah so the, the the parity model is it if you can you think about it as a more powerful version of the original model in the sense that mm -hmm. it can do Right. So, so, so why don't I just replace my original model mm -hmm. with replicas of the parity model? Mm -hmm. Oh no. So, so this is actually uh, doing a different. So this is a new learning task, as uh, I'll briefly mention later. But, but it's so this is more powerful than the other so one. No, because you still need uh, n minus k, like uh, some subset of the other two. So, so it is doing a similar learning task, like image classification, but a harder task so basically now the input is an addition and then it so is it harder? Is it really harder? Uh, so it, it is harder why because now we have this x1 plus x2 as inputs and what it kind of has to do is simultaneously do if you look at this subtraction decoder what kind of you're expecting the parity model to give out as output is f of x1 plus f of x2 right so it's it kind of has to classify both simultaneously. But if you do a linear function, for example, it's not harder. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it is not. Yeah. But if it's not linear, it's not clear what you mean by harder. I mean, you still need the other results to reconstruct the final results. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not so if you, clear so my you mind can, it is So, you hard. can think of it this way, right? So, there is, so, when this parity model is trying to get its outputs, so when it is looking, let's say, at x1, the other input, so in this example, x2 is like noise, right? So if so, there is the signal to noise ratio phenomena that is happening. So as you add more and more, it becomes harder and harder. But that brings up the question of whether the, this model was over provisioned in the first place. Mm -hmm. If you can learn a harder function within the same architecture, mm -hmm. that seems to imply that this model was, mm -hmm. which you know, is it's over provisioned. So I mean, it's not. It's, there's a limit to how much. So you, you mean do, right? when you say when you're saying the model is over provisioned, basically the you, so with the you might not need those many layers. Yes. Or I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're saying that you're learning a harder function. Yeah. The same um, same architecture. Right. Right. So, so it seems that, and there's no free lunch. In there. I mean, that so. yeah. That that's a that's <clears> a very good that's a very good point, and that is why I think having. Uh, a neural architecture search or a better architecture for parity model model can can help in getting better accuracies. I mean, that seems to imply the parity model will be strictly more expensive than the other ones. If you're saying yes. that it's actually going to be right, right. the optimal work. Yes, yes. Okay. That's, by the yeah. way, many of these functions are over provisioned, so I have no problem with the setup, but that's just, yeah. just kind of clarifying the. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, th that's a very good point, yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's a bound on the k you can exhort here? Because at some point you'd end up with noise. Yes, yeah, it, exactly. So as I was mentioning, as we add more and more, it, it gets harder. And uh, we'll see that, you know, like I'll go into the accuracy evaluation and there's more details in the paper. It, it The accuracy drops as we increase k, right? For, this, for the exactly the same reason. Yeah, but currently we don't have a good fundamental understanding of where the bound is. Right, yeah, so it would be very interesting to you know study that that further to understand it better. Yeah, yeah. Have you tried uh, making encoder, decoder, and the parity model all of them learnable? We could do that, yes, yeah. uh, but we haven't uh, done that yet here. What I'm going to show, but what the, it would still have the downside, which I mentioned earlier, because of the requiring you know bulkier front end and the time required for the neural network training for, uh, sorry, not training, when you're going through the redundant path, you know, that additional time would be there. But that's also feasible, jointly training everything. Yeah, that might... Uh, but it's, yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. That might push the K to the upper limit. Possible, yes, yeah. So, as I'll briefly mention later, this actually opens up a really rich design space. There is lots to explore. And you know, like you know, like even training methodologies, and as uh, you know, th we had a very good comment there that you know they could have having a stronger model for the parity model can help. You know, so there are a lot of uh, explorations to be done yet. Yeah. Yeah. But this is like 
I feel like this is a little bit of cheating because mm -hmm. the parity model is just just doing computation on both the things simultaneously. So, right, it's, it's kind of almost like you're taking two networks there and then putting there and then computing both of them. But it is them. not, right? So it's not it's, really doing two networks. But, I mean, if yeah. the network is powerful enough, it's just... No, yeah, so that's why, like, in, in what I talk about in the evaluation, it is the same, it's the same architecture, same latency. So you're not using additional compute. Just so so even if you look at it, if, even if you go into the simpler, let's say, so it's it's more easier to look at it in the linear world. So it's, it's, it's because same thing is happening here. So for example, if you if you had a linear function, then if you just, if you add the inputs and send it, right, even there, in a way, it's acting on two inputs. No, no, I right. agree with the linear function. I completely understand mm. it. But here, like for example, in this case, yeah. right, what is the parity model outputting? It is outputting roughly the, the soft max or the one hot encoding of a cat plus a monkey. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Which means that the output of the parity model already contains enough information. I already know that these two images, one of them contains mm -hmm. a cat, one of them contains right. a monkey just by looking at the output of parity. Yeah, but in, if you agree with the linear case, that's the same thing that's happening in no, the linear case too. No, that's not happening too. because Why? if x1 and x2, I know f of x1, I know f of, f of x2, mm -hmm. and I know the xr, then it does not tell me anything about individual ones. No, the but it is. is it, it is because in the, in, the, in, the, in the linear case, f of x1 plus x2 is f of x1 plus f of x2. It so is x2, know. but individually yeah. it's not telling me anything. It's only like, there are two bits of information, let's mm -hmm. say, and I'm getting only one bit of information from this. But here it's mm -hmm. not that. Here it's not I'm getting, mm -hmm. so let's say this is f of x1 is one bit of information, f of x2 is one bit yeah. of information. But this parity model is all, almost outputting two bits of information. No, it is not. Oh. It is It is still it is, you getting the same length. It's length telling length you cat and no, it it's, not, it's not telling you that. It's only telling you something that after the decoding. Decoding, yeah. Right? It's not telling you anything about it. So the length the of the vector. is just a simple subtraction. No, it's the same, no. Yeah, right. no. So, so, if, so if you think in parallel for the linear case, right, the same thing is happening here. The length of the vector. The information that you're talking about is a function of the length of the vector, right? So if the length of the vector is the same, you cannot give out more information. The, the output that you're thinking about in the linear case, the same is happening here. No, but these vectors are supposed to be like soft max, right? So basically, the output f of x1, mm -hmm. the vector is not really, really a uniform vector. It's mostly like on the cat, it has very sure, value sure, and right. the rest is zero. Right. So it's, you should think of it as just, you know, it's just an indicator vector of a cat roughly. Sure. And mm -hmm. this is the indicator vector of a monkey. Mm -hmm. And what this is outputting is supposedly the indicator vector of a cat plus an plus, indicator yes. vector of a monkey. So it's a plus. So I think that's so the key. Right? But, yeah. but it's giving a lot more information now because I know It better. has to, yeah. So we can chat more, yeah. But I, so if you think about linear case in parallel, it, the same thing is happening. We can chat more, more offline. No, yeah. the, the key is the input to the parity model is the sum. It doesn't have access to x1 or x2. It only has, I agree with that. So, I mean, so, uh, what I'm saying is that you don't need, I mean, if the model is so powerful, you can just combine all the inputs and then train it to output the indicator vector of all things. So, I already know sure. what so, things are there. I just need to figure out what is what. Yeah, but here, the, all the, yeah, we can chat offline, but all the inputs are not going in into the parity model. But we can chat more, yeah. Okay, so, so this, the forward pass and the backward pass, and this is how you train the parity model. And... We have implemented this approach, the second approach, which is the parity models approach, which I will denote as par M for brevity, on top of Clipper, uh, which is an open source prediction <coughs> serving system. And I know Dan is here now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the encoder and the decoder, uh, we have implemented it in the Clipper's front end. And the original and the parity models are all PyTorch models in Docker containers. Okay. So first, in the evaluation, I'll go into the evaluation of accuracy first and then evaluation of latency. So in terms of uh, evaluation of accuracy, uh, as we were discussing earlier, this is a new learning task. And so we evaluated it on a variety of inference tasks and data sets, including image classification, speech recognition, and object localization, and a variety of popular neural network models. And for the encoder and the decoder, uh, I'll show first mainly the most of the results with the generic addition, subtraction, encoder, and the decoder, which b enables us to show the applicability for a variety of tasks, like you know, on image, speech, and object localization. And also, I'll briefly mention about this inference task specific encoder and decoder, that is, for image classification. Uh, for example, you could 
downsize and concatenate as an encoder. So, so in this second one, you don't change the model. Is that right? Um, you. No, no, no. So the pa the uh, we do like the parity model is is still trained. Okay. Yeah, uh, but on both the cases, the architecture is in in the evaluations is the same. Okay, so for looking at accuracy, so look at the overall accuracy as a function of accuracy in the degraded mode and in the normal mode, right? So in the normal mode, I'll call the accuracy as A subscript A, that is when it is available, when everything is available, and in the degraded mode when some of the original models may be unavailable. So Fu is, denotes the fraction of the instances unavailable, and A subscript D is the degraded mode accuracy. And this part now represents the accuracy in the normal mode, that is when all the original models are available. So for the metrics, basically we would want to look at available versus degraded mode accuracy, right? So what is the accuracy on the task when the model is, when original model is unavailable? And also we'll look at overall accuracy. Okay, so in this plot, I'll be showing accuracy on the y-axis in percentage and different data sets or tasks on the x-axis. So higher is better. Uh, so in, in all these, in the initial set of evaluations, uh, I'll use k equal to 2, r equal to 1. That is 33% of the total resources are being used for redundant computation. So here are these yellow bars are accuracy when everything is available. This is basically original model accuracy because the original models are all available. Now, in the degraded mode, that is when one of the original models is not available, these blue bars are the accuracies that are obtained by when using the output from the parity model and then decoding. So as we can see, for all these tasks, we can get pretty good accuracy within around 7% of the original model being available. What is FU? What is FU? Uh, so he, here this is just showing when one of the original model is unavailable. So yeah, so k equal to 2, r equal to 1. And let's say yellow bar is just what is available. Mm -hmm. And then if one of them is not available, what is the accuracy on the decoded output. So FU is one. Fu is one. For one yeah, yeah, right. FU yeah, zero. yeah. So we'll, uh, yeah. So I'll use the FU notation a little bit later. So okay. it, it won't be used in this. Yeah. But is FU one? Is that the right way to think about it? That this is FU equals one case? Yeah, yeah. So basically, I'm sh specifically showing the degraded mode. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, significant accuracy. Um. Uh, True if you, so in, in different ways, in the sense that if you look at it as just the accuracy on the task, it is significant, right? So even like right. a small percentage loss is lost. Right, because people fight over these. Uh, right, exactly. Just getting that next yeah, right. point to. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but if you look at it as this is the output when the original model is not available, mm -hmm. right? So in, in that respect, this is quite promising. Because even the original model is unavailable, you're able to get very close to what is available. Like for example, right, if we look at CIFAR 100, there are these 100 classes. And as, as a rough measure to see how hard is the task is you have 100 classes. And if, we, if you don't have the original model available, a random guess would be 1% accurate, right? So if we just randomly choose one of the uh, classes. So here you're able to get to this original accuracy very close to that. Did you guys so try it? Sorry? Did you guys try imagining? Not yet, yeah. So that's a very good question. So I'll go at not for this addition and subtraction, but when I'll I don't have the numbers on the slide. Uh, but with the image classification specific encoder and, and decoder, uh, so this addition and subtraction would is not doing that well on ImageNet. Uh, but on ImageNet there is also this another uh, uh, issue of you know the training, how we are doing training. So we are randomly choosing images when when training, and there the training data set is too huge. To so I think we need better approaches for training. This I'll talk about in in future work. So a better way of doing training. 
because you have to choose things like pairs of images. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you think about it, right? You know, this this goes into combinatorial space. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we were pretty happy to see that even with CIFAR 100, it's doing pretty well. Yeah. Just sort of curiosity, Rashmi, you might not have to ask for this, so I'll ask this question. If it's there, you can sort of do that. Um, the first part that you described, where you're actually not changing the computation, yeah. where the accuracy would hopefully stay in that, right? Depends on the encoder, decoder, I guess. But um, So you're, you're talking about approach one? Approach one. Okay, yeah. uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh, what is the performance? Impact there? Can you give me a uh, idea in terms of latency, especially for the case where you have, say, one failure? In terms of, oh, how much it, yeah. it adds? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't have it on the slide. Jack, do you remember we I think had that? The encoder alone was at least a few times, so like higher than like our res, or like say we did ResNet 18 for the main model. Yeah. Our encoder that we were using that got the highest accuracy, I think, was at least a few times. Like it took a few times longer. That's that. This is going back to Ricardo's question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the news, which is, hey, right. you know, uh, yeah. straggler. You're dealing with a straggler, but yeah. really, what is the latency That's, of yeah. the code decay? Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that, that was the main reason why we went ahead so and searched for this this approach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just uh, wanted to show the accuracy on the object localization task, which is hard to show in a bar plot like that. So. This is like one specific image example, and this is the ground truth uh, localization. And this yellow box is the available, that is the original model output. And the, the purple box is what is the degraded mode, that is when the original model is unavailable and what is reconstructed from the decoded output. Is 33% redundancy considered reasonable, going back to the previous um, thing? So, um, I, yeah, so uh, th that's... What is for this, for the benefit that you get? I mean, what's the way to think about that? Right. So that's a, that's a very good question, right? So it depends on the application. Okay. Uh, so I've had discussions with several uh, different app uh, teams that have different kind of applications. In some applications where, you, where latency is very critical, I know that even I learned that within Microsoft, even let, I learned that, you know, there are some teams, let's say within Bing, it's so important, the latency is so critical that they are okay even doing full replication. Right, but it's so, not quite just latency, there's also tail latency that you're targeting. I mean, so, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's yeah. a question of how, what is the right way to think about it, yes. how much resources you're willing to spend it. I guess, oh, how does it degrade us, that number? Yes, that, that's, yeah, that's a very good question. So I'll show one of the evaluations here and more details are in the paper. And that is really application dependent as to, you know, how much of the, how much redundancy is it worth it? Part of the question is, as redundancy decreases, how does the number, how do you? Yes, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I, I will talk about briefly. And uh, uh, so that is basically controlled by these parameters, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. There's also a question, um, have you tried this in practice? Have, so you, you have this set up with this front end and, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to send query requests? Because there yeah. is, a, yeah. you need to essentially synchronize mm -hmm. sort of a couple of arrivals, yes. like, like a K, right? You need K, yeah. So if yeah. they're not exactly synchronized, one has to wait for the other, and then you're right. So, so you one might thing, as well do the straggler approach from before. Right? Yeah. So, so that's a very good question. So you need K inputs to uh, encode, but one point is that the origin though the the path through the original models need not wait in the sense that there is no additional delay introduced into the actual original paths so you can pass it through the original models and as you get k you can encode so that path is not affected yeah. but you're right that in order to use this redundant path you need k of them together but in a system with reasonable throughput yeah. that's not a problem so, so, so is the is the right way to think about this that uh, in a system without this capability, I would fire up some inference, one of them might fail, and then I would have to pay the cost of going through inference for that thing again at that point. So it's essentially two times the cost of inference versus this, where we pay a slightly higher cost to recover the output of the lost one. Mm -hmm. But we've been able to overlap the 
work it of, yes. of being able to recover that with right. the original entrance code. Right, right. Yeah. So basically, like, uh, because this is a proactive approach, right? right. So it, it uses the redundant path in parallel. Yeah. 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 So we, yeah. So. Inter query inter arrival time has to be within a certain. Yes. Yeah, so if it is too low, yeah, yeah, that one, yes. Yeah, so we did, uh, so we, so to answer uh, your question, like we did experiment, as you mentioned, actually sending the queries with different throughputs. Uh, so let me see if I have that plot here or it is available in the paper. So we have evaluated with a particular query, different throughputs right. and doing it on the fly, like how you and, mentioned. And presumably in the real system, K wouldn't be two, right? It might be... It, yeah, it could be two. Or, oh, no, K cannot be thousand, yeah. So in the sense that, as, as I'll talk about, like, so k, for example, k equal to, in, when we have k equal to 2, r equal to 1, we have 33% of them, of the resources being used for redundancy, right? So well, as you, just, you tune it. If, if you have a large system, you just do little. Yeah, you, yeah, right. Equal to, yes, it will be smaller groups. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then you have 500 of those. Yes, that exactly, sure. yeah. But hopefully it's still 33% better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if K is equal to two. Yeah. <laughs> if the whole thing is linear, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so now uh, overall accuracy, and this is where I'll have uh, different values of K, and more evaluation with different values of K is available in, in the paper. Okay, so again, overall accuracy, uh, accuracy on the y-axis, so higher is better, and this is where fu for different values is coming in. So on the x-axis, we have different fractions being unavailable, and uh, the yellow line is the available accuracy, because this fu doesn't affect available, so that's assuming everything is available. And now first, uh, this dashed blue line is for parity models with k equal to 4. Now, okay, so we have like 20% of the total sy systems being used for uh, redundancy. So k equal to 4, r equal to 1. And now, as we decrease k, so we are going, so this is for k equal to 3 and this is for k equal to 2. So you can see the overall accuracy improving, right? So, so basically, in, in other words, if as we increase k, accuracy drops, right? So this goes back to the question that was here, like basically you have, uh, as we encode more and more images together, there's more noise going into the parity model when it has, when it has to contrast with the other images. Okay, so now very briefly. Uh, uh, that integration seems linear, I mean, is it, I mean, it's just surprising. Is that, uh, that sort of, which, yes, so it's, as K increases, uh, it's not really linear. Yes, I guess that's not clear from that. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. So we have more evaluation in, in the paper. Yeah. So it's not really linear. I think this line linearity is, is coming from the fractions <laughs> yeah, being unavailable. But yeah. it's the, inter the gap that has The gap. Yeah. No, it's not really Sorry. linear. Yeah. Yeah. And what task is this? Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. I thought I did. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so yeah. So oh, Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Okay, so very quickly, so so far I had used addition encoder and the subtraction decoder, uh, but these encoders and decoder could be simple encoders and decoders, but specific to the classific or the inference tasks at hand. So for example, for image classification task, we evaluated with using an encoder, which is downsizing the images and just concatenating. So for example, uh, let's take k equal to 4 and CIFAR 10, and these are the four four input images, which were the queries, and the encoding, the parity image would be an image where the same sized image, 32 by 32, but four images put together. So downsize and concatenate. Excuse me. So this helps in improving accuracy because this is now specialized. The encoder and decoder is specialized for the inference task at, at hand. Uh, more details are available in the paper. Uh, there is also uh, a concurrent work which built on our approach of learning based coded computation but specializing for image classification which also considered a similar concatenation based encoder okay so now i'll quickly uh, discuss evaluation of the latency so we evaluated on both cpu and gpu clusters 
Uh, and as a baseline comparison, we will use a system with equal resources. So that is giving the same amount of redundancy. That is, the, the number of instances is the same in both. But in the baseline, those resources are used to serve the, the queries, original query. So which means that basically the, the load on that system is much lower. So basically latency would be better. And with varying query rates, this is the input uh, throughput. And uh, varying background traffic ranging from very lightweight inference traffic all the way to a different varying number of shuffles going on. So I'll quickly go through these and uh, more details are available in the paper, which is also available on archive right now. Okay, so now on CPU cluster, now the x-axis is the query rate. Uh, this is, you know, the Poisson arrivals coming in at a different uh, QPS and latency is on the y-axis. So now lower is better. Now, uh, to uh, specifically to Ricardo's question, this includes the latency of waiting for the K queries and then uh, encoding. And so that path, the redundant path includes that latency. Okay, so now here are the tail latencies, 99.9th tail latency. The top line is for the equal resources baseline. And this blue dotted line is what is from uh, the parity models approach. So we see a significant improvement in 99.9th tail latency while keeping the median similar. So the, these two, the, the bottom two lines are the medium for the both of these equal resources baseline and the parity models approach. So we see roughly around 50% reduction in the tail latency while maintaining same median. So specifically, we see the 99.9th percentile getting closer to the median by more than 3.5 fold. What's the degradation of the median? It's not quite the same median. Like. Uh, yeah, I don't have exact numbers on that. It's so you quite the same. Only for the median, it's like half a millisecond. Okay. I think for this one, it's like 0. 0.5 over 70. Roughly, it would be. Hmm. It looks like it's more than 0. 0.5. If I look at the lines. Here, yeah. Maybe we should look at. It just might be the points. If you look at. Yeah. yeah. Because if you're affecting the common case significantly. Something that's significant. Yeah. Like, look in the tail, that's that's a problem. I mean, I, I don't. Those numbers don't look like they are the same. Yeah, this is like 30, 30 vision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can look at the exact numbers offline. Yeah. I mean, let's say if you let's say if you are like losing three percent on three three milliseconds. Right? Jack is IMing you the numbers. <laughs> 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 I'm running new experiments. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, this helps in bringing pre more predictable latency. So basically, bringing the la tail latency down uh, while keeping the median latency similar, or even a little bit increasing the median latency, it's, it's basically making the entire end-to-end -end latency more predictable. How often are machines expected to fail in this world? So yeah, I think that will, more like you know people who have access to production servers would know better. Yeah. You're meeting Matthias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm writing down this question. <laughs> <laughs> He's running another experiment. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're cool. actually, uh, oh, yeah. this is the second half of your talk. No, not second half. No, this is not. Least. Yeah, there is another. Yeah, but, but that's a shorter. Yeah, that's oh, shorter. a shorter. Oh, other thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a shorter talk. I'm so, <laughs> so, yeah, so this is, uh, we, we see similar improvements on, on GPU cluster as well. And we again see improvements even when we have a very light uh, multi tenancy background, which is another prediction, another clipper running with very low query throughput. Okay, so in summary for part one, I've talked about introducing resiliency to machine learning inference, that is prediction serving systems using coded computation. And you know, as you recall, the key challenge here is handling the non-linearity of the neural networks. And our solution to this is using a learning-based approach for coded computation, that is designing coded computation frameworks using machine learning. So this is a rich design space lots to explore on the encoders, decoder, and parity models. Uh, this is applicable for a variety of inference tasks, including classification, speech recognition, image localization, 
and we have implemented it on Clipper and you know, showed the evaluation. We have seen significantly better degraded mode accuracy with no loss in the normal mode and also it helps in making the latency more predictable. Okay, so very quickly this space has opened up a very exciting area within coded computation but there's still a lot more to do. So specifically as I was mentioning earlier, one of the interesting directions is to see how to improve training uh, for these learning-based coded computation approaches. So currently we are using random inputs from the data sets to train and there is combinatorial explosion. So especially for large data sets, uh, improving this learning task or the training strategy would be very useful. And uh, again, as we discussed earlier, there's rich design space. So one could think about designing better generic encoders and the decoders that could work across different inference tasks or you know, also design better task specific encoders and decoders for popular tasks or you know the better choices for the parity models using neural architecture search uh, as Amar was mentioning earlier. And also we're excited about exploring the application of these approaches for other workloads other than prediction serving systems. Because this is a fundamentally new approach for adding redundant computation. So it would be very interesting to see what other workloads are amenable to this kind of redundant computation. Uh, and in the interest of time, since we have we had already had enough questions in between, uh, I'll quickly go through the second part and then time permitting we can come back. Okay. okay. So now in the second part, I'm going to talk about resource efficient redundancy for cluster storage systems. Uh, this work appeared in FAST 2019. This is a joint work uh, with Saurabh Kadikodi, who is a joint student with myself and Greg and Greg. Okay. So, yes, <laughs> no, I, I think he is very proud about the one moment he could surf. <laughs> pull this back. Like. Okay, so story, cluster storage systems are the storage subsystem of distributed systems, typically consisting of thousands to millions of disks. And they're built incrementally over time as demand grows. Right? So failures are common in these storage systems and disk failures are measured using this metric called annualized failure rates, which roughly is expected percentage of the disks that will fail in an year. But when more technically, it's like a conditional expectation. That is, assuming a disk lives for a particular age, then what is its failure rate? And a popular fault tolerance mechanism in storage systems is redundancy. And a few decades ago, data used to be fully replicated three times or more. But more recently, due to the deluge of data, erasure coding is almost always used in large-scale storage systems. So let's take a very quick example to come back again to the storage world in erasure coding. So let's take this example of a uh, slightly different notation here, n equal to 14, k equal to 10. So k still stands for number of data or the original units. And n stands for the total now, which is data plus parity. So in this example, let's take these 10 data units and add four parity units because n is 14. So 10 data and four parity. And these parity blocks now are some functions of these data units and there are different codes. For example, you might have heard about Reed Solomon code, which is very popular. That's how you can get to these parity blocks. And each of these 14 blocks are then stored on different disks stored on different servers and different failure domains typical. Okay, so now let's look into see how this redundancy is configured in these storage systems. So the amount of redundancy added is a function of these parameters as we saw even in the first part. So it's a function of these n and k. For example, if n is 14 and k is 10, the redundancy is 1.4x. Right? So these parameters or this redundancy is configured by choosing these parameters to meet constraints on durability and availability. For instance, a popular metric for durability is mean time to data loss. And for availability, there are various constraints on reconstruction. For example, when a data unit is unavailable, what is the amount of work that you have to do in order to reconstruct it? And these are chosen based on an average failure rate estimate across the disk fleet. And these 
configurations are typically chosen at the time when the data is erasure coded and is not modified thereafter. So essentially, a key observation to make here is that the current redundancy configuration approaches are static. However, the failure rates which basically determine the amount of you know, durability or the availability that you get are not static. In fact, they are very far from being static. So we performed a study on failure data made available by a online backup service called Backplace and observed that failure rates are in fact highly varying. So they vary across disk families. For example, here, these are the six disk families in the Backplace data set and they vary highly and they vary over time. So this is a textbook plot of how typical failure rate of disk drives or, or in general commodity components follow. So this is called a bathtub curve where there is some infancy where the failure rate is high and then there is a lower failure rate region which is called useful life and then again the failure rate goes up which is called wear out or old age. So, so this is a textbook curve but these this is the real curve from the Backplace data set. So this is an, a cumulative AFR curve for one of the disk families uh, in Backplace data set. And we can roughly see there being you know, infancy, useful life, and wear out stages. And these are the failure rate curves over time for all the six different disk families in the Backplace data set. So, Roughly, we can see in the top three, there is a bottom characteristic. And in the bottom three, they are still too young. They have not yet reached the wear out stage yet. Okay, so based on these observations, we're proposing a dynamic approach for redundancy configuration in cluster storage systems. And the key idea is to exploit reliability heterogeneity by tailoring the redundancy levels to the observed failure rates of different disk groups and over time. So let me give an illustration of what we mean by that. So let's take a disk group and, and let's say this is the timeline. Now it is deployed and we start monitoring it. So there is some infancy period and then it goes through useful life and at some stage the wear out starts and then the failure rate starts increasing and it is decommissioned at some time. So in order to make a case for dynamic redundancy configuration, we are taking the most conservative approach of using the default fault tolerance scheme in the infancy and wear out stage. But in the useful life region where the failure rate is lower, we use a disk group specific fault tolerance scheme. And this disk group specific fault tolerance scheme can be of lower redundancy because the failure rate is lower and this is where the cost savings or the storage space savings comes from. So in order to do this, we have proposed a, a tool which we call Heterogeneity Aware Redundancy Tuner or HART for short, uh, which takes durability and availability requirements and the disk health monitoring data as input. And almost all large scale cluster storage systems already have mechanisms in place to monitor disk health. And the tool consists of three units. So one is an anomaly detector, a change point detector, and a redundancy tuner. And I will quickly go through what these are and why we need it. So the, for the anomaly detector, so the failure rates in the useful life period is typically stable within reasonable bounds. However, there could be external factors that lead to bulk failures. For example, rack power failure or, you know, or human error or accidents. And such anomalies appear like premature wear out. I'm calling it anomalies not because they are rare, they happen often. But redundancy is not the approach to add resilience against such anomalies. So basically they need to be handled using other approaches like careful placement and other approaches. So we don't want to consider them as a failure rate increase phenomenon. So that is why I'm calling it as anomalies. So, and it's important for us to identify these anomalies because the benefits of redundancy tuning is dependent on the length of the useful life period. So for example, if this is the actual timeline where we have end of infancy, wear out and decommissioning, 
and we are using default schemes in infancy and wear out but using a disc group specific scheme use in the useful life period. If there is an anomaly in between anomalous failure, the useful life period gets shrunk. So we need to be able to identify these. So here is the real uh, AFR curve from the back place data set and there are actually three anomalous jumps here which have uh, happened in spikes due to simultaneous bulk failures of hundreds of disks. And we have later confirmed with Backblaze that they are really anomalous uh, failures. Okay, so this is why we need an anomaly detector. And now next, a change point detector. So as I was mentioning, the crux of this tailoring redundancy is to identify transitions from infancy to useful life and useful life to wear out for disk families. And we, and this is where the change point detectors are needed. So we use an online change point detection mechanism to identify these points. And here, again, a caution is needed because the reliability target can be missed if we are hasty in declaring useful life or if we are too delayed in declaring the onset of wear out. Right? So there is a trade-off between the benefits here and, and safety. So, uh, and an, add an, as an added safety measure, we add additional buffer to the estimated AFR in the useful life period. And even with an added buffer, we can get significant savings as I'll show later. Okay, and the last piece, which is the redundancy tuner, basically chooses the most space efficient erasure code that can be chosen based on the requirement that is still meeting the durability and availability requirements for the estimated useful life AFR. So we've evaluated this on the Backplace data set, which consists of hundreds of thousands of disks belonging to their production cluster, which is these disks actually constitute more than 90% of their entire cluster storage system. So it has six drive make models, mostly this is the 100,000 or more disks. There are others which are much smaller, so we don't consider them in the evaluation. And it has more than five years of failure data. So in the, in the plots that I'm going to show, uh, we'll use the following methodology. So in, in HART, we have used so far like off-the-shelf anomaly detectors and the change point detectors. They work fine. And the reliability target is chosen based on the highest AFR scheme. So basically, we need some target for reliability when choosing the uh, disk group specific fault tolerance scheme. So in the plot that I'm going to show, we will choose the one family with the highest AFR and say that's the target because that's how the system, it has to meet that, so right? So that's the target. And the disk group specific fault tolerance schemes are chosen to meet the following constraints. So one is you want to be able to tolerate as many failures as the default scheme. And there's an upper bound on the stripe width K. This is for availability. That is when something is unavailable, you don't want to touch too wide. Okay. So for this specific data set, S4 is a family of disks is the highest AFR. So we will use that as the target, which has 4% AFR in the useful life period. And this, so this is going to be the default scheme. So the default scheme always meets the uh, MTTDL target for this S4 family of disks. And the upper bound I'll use in the plots is twice, twice the na value of K that is allowed for default. Anyway, this is not fundamental. Any constraints that the system administrator has can be put in. And we evaluated it on multiple default options. So these two are the ones that I'll specifically show you here. And these are the two published numbers from Google and Facebook. Yeah. So when you, when you go from one redundancy scheme to another, yeah. then you have to move a lot of data? Uh, that's a very good question. And I will come to that. Yeah. So you don't have to move. You'll have to change the erasure code that you're employing. So there is like conversion that needs to happen. So there is overhead. So, so that is an expensive operation, right? Yes, that's, and that's a very whenever good whenever an anomaly happens, you, you have to do it again for, um, for that group. Uh, so what because, do you mean by anomaly? Because when an anomaly happens, yeah. you 
you said, well, I'm going to assume that the, the wearout has started. No, look, we, we don't want to assume. That. So that, that is where we will detect. So basically, the anomaly detector processes the failure data, and it removes out such anomalies. And it basically, in, in determining the useful life, when it ends, right. and what's the AFR, those are it not considered. That's not the yes. beginning of the Yes, wear out. Yes, out, yeah. Right. right. I think that's what she's calling it, an anomaly. She doesn't want to do the, yeah. yeah. It's only the transition point. Right, yeah. right. Okay, so... This is a one this is one of the disk families within the backplace data set and the black the red curve is the raw AFR curve and the black curve is after curations there are some small anomalous things here this is a, a huge uh, group of disks for the, this specific family uh, and the gray line the gray region is the identified useful life so this is the infant mortality end and this is the old age. So this is identified by the change point detector. And the dotted line is the AFR value, which is the AFR at the beginning of the useful life period plus the buffer that we have added. And for wear out, we are being very conservative in, this, in these plots. As soon as the determined AFR is above the threshold, we declare wear out. Okay, so very quickly, uh, for the default scheme, n equal to 9k equal to 6, which is 6 data, 3 parities, which is a small storage overhead already, which is only 1.5x. And infancy uses 9.6, wear out uses 9.6, and the disk group specific scheme is used only in the useful life. And in this plot, y-axis is the disk space savings, and the x-axis is different disk groups. So if you recall, S4 was the baseline. That is, we are not changing the scheme for S4. That's the highest failure rate group that uses the default scheme, and that's the target MTTDL. And for H4A, which is another disk group, we have about 16% savings in the disk space when you use a, a specific scheme for that group, for the determined AFR. Uh, and the, the scheme used is k equal to 12, n is equal to 15 for that. That's what the redundancy tuner chooses. And for another disk group, we have about 13% savings. And we have, similarly, if we look at the 1410 default scheme, which is even smaller storage overhead of only 1.4x, we have about 14% and 11% uh, space savings. So overall, we have about 11% to 16% storage space savings even in a space optimized that is already using erasure code storage systems. And these numbers, while look modest, they translate to significant cost savings in large scale systems. So in summary, we've proposed a dynamic redundancy configuration uh, mechanism for cluster storage systems for exploiting this heterogeneity in reliability of disks in large scale systems by tailoring the redundancy schemes to observe failure rates and changing them over time. And on evaluation of the, on the backplace data set, we saw that it provides significant space savings. And this basically established the potential for dynamic redundancy configuration. And uh, we have seen significant interest from the industry and NetApp and Google have actually shared their failure data with us, which we are working on right now. So this is just the beginning, and there is, again, a lot of interesting open problems to uh, study here. So one of the directions is the statistical study of these uh, AFR curves estimation and the bounds. Uh, currently, the bounds that we have uh, require a large number of disks to get the confidence on, on the AFR curves. But uh, they, they are loose, I think. So we, if we do a uh, more systematic statistical study, we can get the bounds much tighter, which means that we can start using tailoring for even for smaller disk, uh, number of disks. And also, another very important direction is what uh, the question Ricardo asked is about the overhead of redundancy scheme conversion. So that is not free. That is, it incurs huge amount of disk I.O., especially when changing the erasure code configuration because like you if there is no uh, no better mechanism in place you have to re-encode all the data which is a lot of io and cpu so so we are looking into both 
systems solution that is designing better redundancy management. So there are ways in which you can preempt these transitions and plan out such that that overhead can be reduced. And also uh, on the theory side, uh, we're looking at new class of storage codes that make these conversions efficient. So while retaining all other properties the same, they can help in making these transitions much, much lower. So I'm super excited about this. We have a very recent paper up online. We're calling it convertible codes. That is, they help in making conversions more efficient. And still, there are a lot of questions to explore in this space. Cool. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take any more questions. There were quite a few questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's known, so we let people get Sure. Yeah. 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 So we can be offline. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, be happy to chat awesome. more. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.